We think of footballers in lots of different ways. As artists, poachers, and destroyers, in terms of the way in which they play the game. As leaders, in terms of the example they set and their influence on the dressing room. Or as assets, who can be bought and sold for a profit or to facilitate the arrival of someone else. Above all else though, we tend to think of footballers as being a football brain and two legs, with each of these three body parts defining how useful they are within the broader context of a team of 11 and a squad of 25, and therefore determining what we think of them. We rarely think about footballers in the context of them being actual human beings. In fact, I would argue that we, and by we in this context, I mean primarily fans and the media, rarely think about footballers as being sentient beings at all, each with their own lives, their own highs and lows, and their own aches, strains, and pains. But rather, we view them almost as robots, automated to perform a certain role on a match day and ceasing to exist outside of that role. It's a little bit like how a lot of kids view teachers when you are at school. There is a certain strangeness to seeing a teacher outside of school, whether that be in a supermarket or just out and about in town, because we have a tendency, as children, to compartmentalise teachers in our heads as just being teachers. What do they do? They teach. That's it. They don't buy food or go to the cinema. That would be weird. Where do they live? Well, at the school, that's where, of course, they were born there, or grown in the lab somehow, I'm not quite sure how it works, as fully grown teachers, they eat at the school, they sleep at the school, and, sadly, someday they will die at the school. They're a bit like prisoners in that sense, who are serving a life sentence. But instead of just prisonering around doing prisoner things, they teach and do teacher things, and instead of being stuck in a prison, they are stuck in a school. Which, somehow, seems so much worse. Apologies to any teachers who may be watching, I am talking from the perspective of a young child, and I'm exaggerating a little for comic effect, which is something that I often do on this channel just to spice things up a bit and because my boundless wit and humour cannot be contained. But you get the idea, and I think we do something very similar with footballers. Whilst the teacher example seems, and I think probably is a relatively harmless one, which is restricted largely to children, Reducing footballers to automatons who exist in our minds and in our lives only as being transfer rumours, supposedly on the verge of being bought and sold, which, again, is language that we would typically associate with assets, objects and goods, rather than people, or as individual cogs within a team or squad on a match day who have quite narrowly defined roles, responsibilities and skill sets, which mean that they are capable of performing those roles, is one that almost all of us hang onto as adults, and is one that can have quite damaging and indeed even devastating consequences at times. I mentioned briefly there about the dehumanising language with which we often talk about footballers, but it's not just the framing of footballers as assets that are there to be bought and sold like very expensive cattle, but it's little things that we're all guilty of falling into the trap of saying. How many times must I have said on this channel that player X or Y was or is a product of the Arsenal or Bayern Munich academies? Just to give one example. I tried to use the word graduate of an academy rather than product for exactly that reason, but I'm sure there are plenty of times that I slip up. And really, we ought not blame ourselves a lot of the time for this use of language. The reason we describe graduates of a club's academy as products is because that is exactly how those clubs treat and perceive them. Football is an extremely cutthroat business. Young players might earn obscene salaries at some levels of the game, but only ever out of self-interest on the club's part. Big contracts are almost never meted out by football clubs because of any loyalty or goodwill, and we see this in action all of the time. The second that you, as a footballer, are no longer deemed to be valuable to a football club, they will happily toss you onto the biggest scrap heap that they can find, without so much as a thank you, a farewell, or a, uh, hey, do you think you might actually need some mental health support here, or at least, you know, to be treated with a very basic sense of human decency? Because, ultimately, whilst most people 
are unlikely to feel much sympathy for anyone who earns more in a week than they do in a year, for obvious reasons. For every Phil Foden and Bakayo Saka, there is a whole heap of bodies beneath them, whose names we never know, let alone chance on their terraces, who also put their entire lives into football up to that age, often at the expense of their education, which tends to be encouraged either implicitly or explicitly by football clubs, and are left feeling as though the rug has just been pulled from underneath their feet, their lives have been turned upside down, and they have very little support. I said a heap of bodies there, which may have been a little emotive and hyperbolic because of the point in imagery that I wanted to get across. But there are young people, teenagers, who have taken their own lives after being released by clubs and told, with little warning at least as far as they were concerned, that they weren't good enough. And a great many more who suffer from suicidal ideations, severe mental health problems, and a distinct lack of life prospects. Of course, not every youth team player can get a professional contract. Only a tiny percentage can. But equally, we should ask ourselves, at what age should children have agents and be brought into a formal football environment? How much of their education, and more importantly, just their childhood, should they be made to sacrifice? And what processes should be in place for if, or in the vast majority of cases when, they do receive that earth-shattering news, that they are being released. Should professional football clubs and agents really have any business entering into negotiations with kids or the families of kids as young as nine years old or even younger in the case of pre-academies? Or should kids who are that age just be having a kickabout at school or down the park with their mates and maybe having some pretty relaxed training and match days on a weekend for their local team if they want to? Personally, I doubt that bringing an eight or nine year old into an academy system and introducing them to more professional coaching methods even benefits their game at that age. It seems more likely to stifle their natural development and creative freedom whilst running the risk of sapping some of their organic love of the game out of them. It is just a case of clubs being desperate not to miss out on the next Wayne Rooney or Jack Grealish who were obviously worth a fortune to Everton and Aston Villa, enough to fund their academies for years to come, and the fact that they are terrified of missing out on the next big thing to another club, thus pushing them to sign ever younger and younger players, but even supposing that it was beneficial to their development and did make a difference, a big difference even, let's say, how many young people's lives are we willing to sacrifice at the altar of producing slightly more tactically or technically adept teenagers. And all for what? The sake of a few extra points on a board. When you boil it down to that, which is all that it really is, the whole thing seems rather sordid and grotesque. I know that it might still seem as though I am being hyperbolic, but in October 2020, former Man City Academy player Jeremy Whiston took his own life. Whiston had been tipped as having a bright future in the game, but in January 2018, he suffered a serious knee injury, and the following December, the club released him. At an inquest following his suicide, which received more press attention than most, due to Whiston having several high-profile friends who had become professionals, and who dedicated goals or paid tribute to him, the inquest heard that Whiston had not received the right support from Manchester City after he was released. In 2021, 20-year-old Said Visson, formerly of the AC Milan and Benevento Academies, also took his own life. And at roughly the same time, former Fulham Academy player Ashley Thompson said that he had contemplated suicide after getting released by the Cottagers at the age of 18. A lack of support by clubs has been cited in the suicides of other young men whose identities haven't been made public, and former PFA Chief Executive Gordon Taylor described the epidemic of young players suffering from mental health difficulties after being released as being football's biggest issue. Yet, it is an issue which receives barely any attention and commands next to no column inches. Every one of these young players, and typically their families, are sold a dream. The chance to play the game that they love at the highest level, in front of tens of thousands of adoring fans and the untold riches that football will inevitably bring them. Parents are told that their children are the next big thing by people who should know better. 
and do know better, when it comes to the tiny percentage of kids that will ever actually play the game professionally, let alone play in the Premier League and be set for life. I'll be honest, this is a video that I have wanted to make for a while about the way in which we casually dehumanise footballers whilst thinking nothing of it. And I'd always thought about it more in the context that I am about to come on to, but it was only when I actually put pen to paper and started to think about the way in which that perception intertwines with reality, and more to the point, where it comes from, that the insidiousness of it and the damage that it can cause in what I think must be its most visceral form, released academy players, was really driven home to me. In a lot of cases, certainly the biggest academies, we are talking about some of the richest clubs in the world, owned almost exclusively by billionaires. There is really no excuse, therefore, for them to sell children as young as nine a dream, take complete control over their lives, up to the age of 16 or 17, and then drop it on them that, actually, they're no use to them, with virtually no support network to help them deal with that news and to put them on a decent footing in terms of whatever the daunting next step in their lives might be. It's worth noting that a lot of Americans find it crazy, just as we do with their gun violence and cheese in a can, that we Europeans do this with young athletes, particularly in football, taking them out of their education and putting such huge emphasis on them achieving something that 99% plus of them never will. It's not just released academy players who are impacted by the general dehumanising of footballers, of course, and that lack of support leading to severe mental health difficulties applies equally to players once they retire, as incidents of divorce, alcoholism, and gambling addiction skyrocket, even amongst those who have earned very well playing their game. I don't want to tread on any old ground here, and I would recommend watching the video that I made, which is entitled, Why 40% of Footballers Go Bankrupt, if you are interested in, well, the answer to that question for a start, but also the issue of footballers post-retirement and the difficulties they so often have, both financially and otherwise. The first time that I ever really thought about the unusual way in which footballers are perceived of being somehow subhuman, or at the very least, lacking in the basic emotions and aspects of life that most of us experience, which hit me particularly hard because of just how guilty I'd been of doing exactly that, was in the case of Jake Livermore. I must apologise at this stage for the customary Hull City reference, but Jake Livermore joined Hull City on loan from Tottenham Hotspur in the summer of 2013, when we were newly promoted to the Premier League under manager Steve Bruce. Livermore's signing was announced on the same day as Tom Huddleston's, both arriving from Tottenham, though Huddleston was signed on a permanent basis for £5 million. When Livermore and Huddleston signed on the same day, the focus, unsurprisingly I think, was on Huddleston. He was much more experienced, he had played far more games at Tottenham, including some impressive performances in the Champions League, so everyone knew how technically gifted he was, and it just seemed like a significant signing for the club. Livermore, on the other hand, had played far fewer games to Spurs, so people knew less about him, and he had previously had maybe four or five lower league loan moves without ever really setting the world alight. In tandem that season, however, Livermore and Huddleston were both outstanding. And if you forced me to choose one of them at the time, I would have said that Livermore was probably more important and certainly more effective for us in terms of his running and energy midfield, his ability to win the ball back and to drive us up the pitch, even if Huddleston was, admittedly, easier on the eye. I promise you that there is a point to all of this. Following his season on loan, Hull City signed Livermore for £6.5 million, rising to £8 million subject to add-ons, which was a club record at the time. But few could have argued that he wasn't worth it. But in his second season at what was then the KCOM Stadium, Livermore was, well, he was awful. And I don't just mean he dropped off a bit. I thought that he was our worst player that season, he seemed slow to second balls, his passing was all over the place, and I found it incredible that Bruce almost never dropped him. Towards the end of that season, in which we were relegated, Livermore was asked to take a random drugs test following a 2-0 win against Crystal Palace. He tested positive for cocaine, and when that news broke, 
I can remember spending that night with a group of friends and having some not very nice things to say about him. I'm not some kind of prude or zealot against drug use or anything, but it was like, this guy was our record signing, he's on big wages, we're struggling down at the bottom of the league, he's been rubbish all season, and all the while, he's been living it up with a nose full of Charlie on a weekend. As it transpired, and as was known to the club, but not supporters, Livermore had been dealing with a personal tragedy, namely the death, of his infant child almost a year ago. I am sure that there are some people out there who would say that plenty of footballers will have lost children and won't have turned to cocaine at any stage, and I am obviously not recommending cocaine as a cure for grief. But you would have to have a heart of stone not to feel for Livermore, and not to be able to understand what a dark place he must have been in to make that decision knowing full well, surely, at the time, that it could cost him his career, or at the very least, a significant chunk of it. Thankfully, in my view, the FA took sympathy on Livermore given his personal circumstances, and issued him with a lenient ban, which, whilst he was officially suspended for four months, since that included the off-season, effectively meant that he was only ruled out for about a month's worth of actual football. Livermore returned the following season to play a pivotal role in Hull City, making an immediate return to the Premier League. He was subsequently sold to West Brom for £10 million, and in March 2017, he was recalled to the England squad by Gareth Southgate, more than five years on, from his first and only previous cap for the three lines. Not only did I feel bad about slating Livermore for being rubbish, even though I obviously had no way of knowing about his personal circumstances at the time, it made me reassess all of the judgments that we make about players and their performances, and how quick we are to pour scorn upon them. There are days at work when I feel unwell or have some kind of worry or distraction going on in my life which impacts my work. I'm sure every one of you is the same. Yet, we rarely extend that sympathy to players. When a footballer has a bad game, the first suggestion tends to be that they're just not very good. Tactically, maybe something was wrong, or perhaps there was a lack of effort on their part. We don't tend to think, I wonder if their dog might have just died. And of course we don't, in fairness, because that would be a bit of an odd go-to suggestion. I can't really imagine watching Sky Sports, Graham Souness launching into a trademark takedown of Paul Pogba, branding him a disgrace and not fit to wear the shirt, and Jamie Redknapp piping up and saying, hang on a minute now, Graham, when was the last time that you saw Mr. Waffles? Because he played all right at Leicester last week, but I haven't seen that golden retriever pop up on his Instagram story once this week. Yeah, that would be odd. But we ought to acknowledge that players have all of the same problems that most of us do. They have headaches, flu, grief, arguments with loved ones, divorces, a child keeping them up all night screaming the night before a game, problems with the towels in the new swimming pool. Yeah, all right, not all of the same problems, but a lot of the major ones, which tend to be the ones that would have the biggest impact upon their manner, training, and performance levels. We tend to idolize and even deify athletes who are able to block all of those external factors out and still perform, and maybe there is something praiseworthy about that. I'm sure many of you will have watched The Last Dance on Netflix, which I really enjoyed, and if you haven't, it is a documentary series about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, with a particular focus on Jordan's final season with the team. I won't spoil it for those of you who are unfamiliar with the NBA and haven't seen it and might wish to do so in the future, but I would say one of the dominant themes of the series is Jordan's mentality in terms of his relentless pursuit of success, the extremely high demands that he had of others, and the way in which he was able not just to block out anything that might have been happening in his own life in order to focus on his basketball, but quite often he would actively create false grievances and invent conflicts to try and motivate himself even more. It was fascinating, and it's something that you will find in a lot of other top athletes, whether that might be Tom Brady or Cristiano Ronaldo, and it is almost solely singled out as being praiseworthy. As I said, maybe there are some admirable qualities to certain aspects of it, 
Certainly, in the eyes of supporters, managers and owners, they want players who are ruthless, consistent machines who they know will produce when it matters most. And I think it would be difficult to watch The Last Dance without some of Jordan's ambition and drive rubbing off on you in a positive sense. But I can't help but wonder how healthy it actually is for the athletes themselves to operate on that basis. You are essentially switching your brain off, or attempting to, for the purpose of your career. And whilst I have absolutely no qualifications in psychology, or anything else for that matter it should be said, and would not claim to hold any insights into the field, I am pretty sure that just turn it off isn't what a therapist would recommend when attempting to deal with all of the highs and lows which occur during all of our lives. So now when a whole city player has an absolute stinker, and one of my mates says that they're hopeless, I do genuinely sometimes say, maybe something is going on in their lives that we don't know about. And they, inevitably, look at me like I'm really weird. Maybe they just found out, this player, that one of their parents has been taken ill. I know that that would likely have a big impact upon the amount of and the quality of work that I would be able to do if I had just had that phone call. It doesn't even need to be some big great event. People's moods fluctuate and whilst there is at least an acknowledgement of the fact that mental health as a concept exists in football now, which I'm not sure was the case even 10 or 15 years ago, it isn't something that fans and pundits often consider when a player is maybe just going through a bit of a sticky patch of form. Whilst mental health is obviously something that fans don't normally find out about unless something goes really badly wrong and therefore it becomes public, or the player volunteers the information themselves, which is extremely rare during their careers, we like to think that we do know about physical injuries. When a player pulls a hamstring, we know what that means. When they go down with cramp, we know the cause, the cure, and the consequences, in addition to exactly how that feels. So when a footballer is sidelined for nine months with an ACL injury, just to give one example, since everyone knows how bad a tear of your anterior cruciate ligament can be, when they return and it takes them a little while to get up to speed, and maybe their first few performances back in the team are not quite right, we tend to be pretty understanding. The lad has just been out for nine months, give him a bloody chance, and sure enough, with a bit of patience, that is sometimes all that it takes. The reality, however, is that we only ever hear about the injuries that cause players to miss games, and sometimes we don't even hear about them, or at least the true extent of them. I play football once a week at a very amateur level, and even then I get kicked, I pick up knocks here and there, I roll my ankles sometimes, and so on and so forth. Sometimes, something really bad happens and I can't play for a while, but most of the time, it just causes a bit of discomfort and pain and might flare up again or be aggravated if I'm not careful. Footballers have this, but on steroids. Not literally, of course. They play football at a speed and intensity that most of us cannot even imagine actually being in the midst of, rather than just watching from the stands or on television. They are training hard multiple times a week and they still sometimes hurt themselves in stupid ways like the rest of us whilst they're not even playing football. Though football has become less physical in terms of actual contact between players and the types of challenges that used to be permissible, the speed of the game and the physical demands that are put on players have never been higher. And if you speak to any professional football player, they will tell you that they will be lucky to play three or four games a season in which they are genuinely 100%. That is to say that they go into that game with no aches or pains, nothing in the back of their minds that could cause them problems, and nothing that has needed icing, injecting, or some kind of treatment over the last few days. That is just the reality of playing professional football. But as fans, we don't normally know if a player is at 90%, 95%, or at 45% and is really struggling just to walk when they get home, but has been juiced up to the eyeballs by physios at their manager's request because they think that their second choice right back is hopeless and they're terrified of playing them and losing their own jobs. Not only are there active injuries, but former ones leave their marks, some players never fully recover from serious setbacks, and they also take a mental toll as well. 
I remember Steven Gerrard wrote in his autobiography that whilst Daniel Sturridge did get a lot of injuries at Liverpool, sometimes Gerrard had to convince him to play because Sturridge felt that his fitness wasn't quite right. In Gerrard's eyes, it is evident that he believes Sturridge was often fit enough to play, even if he wasn't 100% because, like I said, if you only played at 100%, you'd only play three or four games a season. But that Sturridge feared getting injured and didn't have an indestructible mentality, as Gerrard described it, like Luis Suarez did. I am sure Sturridge would suggest that he knew his own body better than anyone else, and that it is easy for other people to make that assessment for him without ever having had the number of injuries that he has had. But whichever side of that particular debate you fall down on, it is just further evidence of all of the things that are going on in players' lives, minds, and bodies, which are bound to spill out onto their performances on the pitch, but that we never know about, and very rarely even consider. Again, though, I don't think that this is necessarily our own fault. Footballers exist less in our minds as humans, in some sense because they have become less human and far more detached throughout the years. There was a time when football teams were made up largely of players who were born locally, live locally, you knew their friends and families, you would interact with them outside of football, and they would most likely be in your local having a few pints, sharing similar grievances or celebrations as yourselves, essentially at one with supporters on the evening of a game. Gradually though, over the years, almost all of those connections have been eroded. Some teams still have local lads in them, though it tends to only be one or two first team players, and some have none at all. Lots of players, just by virtue of the fact that football clubs tend to be based in inner cities, and wealthy people who can buy big houses tend not to live in inner cities, no longer live as locally to their club's ground, and at the highest level, the wages that most players earn are totally alien to ordinary people, and otherizes footballers even more, making them more like the mill owners and industrial barons that used to own the clubs, rather than the lowly players themselves. I think the relationship between fans and players probably reached nadir in about the mid-2000s, and has improved a little since then, despite wages continuing to rise, just because the age group of players coming through now tend to be a little bit more outspoken, personable, and are able to communicate directly with fans, even if it isn't in a pub, but through the power of social media. You also have to remember that footballers have been dehumanised by the major newspapers, certainly in this country, I cannot speak quite so much to other countries' media ecosystems, for many, many years. Because, and this is absolutely the primary reason as far as I'm concerned, most of the hacks at the Telegraph, the Mail, or the Times went to much more expensive schools, grew up in much nicer houses with much wealthier parents, and speak the so-called Queen's English much better than most footballers, yet these footballers have the temerity to earn far more money than them. It is an affront, as far as they are concerned, to the way in which Britain is supposed to function, a country with among the lowest levels of social mobility anywhere in the world, where football really is a golden ticket from a council estate to a Cheshire mansion if you are good enough and committed enough, yet that dream, and a lack of viable alternatives is also the very reason why the emphasis is so great on the sport for children, and why the highly likely release by an academy can be so devastating. You start to get an idea here of how so many of these issues tend to intertwine, but certainly the way in which newspapers talk about footballers, primarily I should say on the front pages rather than the back pages, which inevitably trickles down to television, radio, and social media, is profoundly negative and dehumanizing. I always found it bizarre growing up that whenever there seemed to be any anger about how much some people earn, footballers were the first targets. But it's not actually bizarre at all. It is very easy to rally against footballers' wages, even though they don't really scratch the surface in terms of the genuinely super rich, because you can appeal to people's perfectly legitimate grievances about their own low and either stagnant or falling wages and living standards without them actually directing those grievances anywhere important or worthwhile. If the boss of your company, which 
won't even pay you a living wage, is taking home a £3 million bonus, meanwhile shareholders of that company are pocketing a £300 million dividend for doing absolutely nothing, well, what is happening there is that you are being exploited and underpaid for your labour. Meanwhile, someone who is already very rich profits from your hard work. If you don't earn a living wage and Harry Kane earns £200,000 a week, well, I mean, I suppose it highlights a broader problem with inequality, you might think, but those two facts are pretty much unrelated. You getting angry at Harry Kane because Tottenham's billionaire owner offered him a multi-million pound contract because he is worth many millions of pounds to Tottenham is not materially going to improve your circumstances. All the while, these newspapers never rally against or quote the net worth and income of the people who actually own them, like Rupert Murdoch, whose net worth is around $18 billion, far more than any footballer, and meaning that Harry Kane could stay under contract and earn £200,000 a week at Tottenham for 1,400 years without spending a single penny, and he still wouldn't have as much money, as the scrotum-faced Aussie hate monger who owns so many of our papers. We do get brief glimpses of the humanity of footballers, like when Christian Eriksen collapsed during Euro 2020, and the whole world of football seemed to stop and hold its breath, fearing the worst, but hoping for the best. In that moment, Eriksen's humanity was all that mattered. Whether he played football again, how many games he might play, or goals and assists he might score in the future, was utterly unimportant. We saw that, first and foremost, he was a person, just like us, with a family who were terrified about him. And it's interesting that almost a year on, now Ericsson is not only still alive, but is actually back playing again, he is treated by the media and fans as, above all else, a human being. He has been excellent since signing for Brentford, don't get me wrong, but that is secondary to how wholesome it has been, watching him return to football and seeing him be applauded by his teammates when he was recalled to the Danish national team. Of course, just to be clear, I am not saying that we shouldn't criticise footballers. That law would potentially put me out of the job. Nor am I saying that we all need to carefully police our language and the language of others for fear of dehumanising footballers. That seems like a great way in which to lose just about all of your friends. But I do think that we would all benefit from seeing footballers as more than robots who run around a football pitch and as people whose job it is to play football, just like our jobs are, whatever our jobs are. Clubs themselves have begun to realise this, even if it is only out of their own self-interest. Sports psychologists are now standard practice at all of the big clubs, hopefully able to provide support to players when they are going through difficult times. A step which was taken by clubs, first and foremost, because they realised that a player's mental state can impact their performances and, obviously, they don't want their performance levels to drop. The contrast between even that and the level of support that is offered to players who are released or retire is a telling one, though. And whilst the power, by its very nature, is concentrated in the hands of the powerful, perhaps if we as fans were at least conscious of the shoddy way in which players are discarded of once they are no longer useful, and I am referring primarily there to almost the farming of young people being grown to play football, but where the vast majority of them will get chewed up and spat out without a second's thought, and some academies do even call themselves farms, maybe that would actually force clubs, agents, and the entire football community to reassess lots of their practices, to consider the damage that they might be causing, and to look briefly beyond the dollar signs alone. Nah, you're right. Never gonna happen. That is it for today's video. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. If that was the case, then why not hit the like button? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments and make sure that you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also find me personally on social media on either Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. Have a great day.